Now, on the other end, you have a Roman context, and this is the reason why we're reading Warren Carter's work. So please pay attention to these readings. Uh, not only is your midterm and final uh, uh, coming directly from these readings, uh, these readings will help you fully understand the Roman context and the uh, Judean Jewish context of the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, but now let's uh, focus now on the Roman context of the Gospel of Matthew. In the year 63 before the Common Era, General Pompey of Rome uh, lands in um, on the coast of Caesarea. Well, it wasn't even Caesarea at the time on the coast of this city on the water in Judea, and he annexes Judea. And so the political powers that were running Judea at the time um, <clears throat> acquiesced. They did not fight. They did not challenge Rome. They accepted Rome's annexation. And they did so probably because they're on a border. They're a border nation between Rome and Persia, uh, and they were giving their allegiance to Rome because they thought that Rome was more powerful and they would be able to protect them from the Persians uh, for if, if there was ever any kind of war between the two. Uh, Herod uh, was Rome's client king. Client uh, is, is an interesting word um, because it, there's a patron-client conception in the first century specifically related to Rome where Rome is the great patron and everybody else uh, uh, everybody else is subservient and a client to Rome. So if you were a uh, legitimate client, Rome would take care of you and provide you with, the, with what you needed, but you had to pay taxes back to Rome and as a way of saying thank you and uh, accepting that. So uh, Herod was a client king. They accepted Herod's kingship and his political leadership over Judea. Uh, sometimes Rome would come in and uh, do away with the political structures that existed in these independent regions uh, and then institute their own uh, government. Now, that would eventually happen uh, in Judea, but when uh, Pompey came in to annex this, uh, Herod was already a good friend of uh, Augustus Caesar, so they let him stay in charge, and he ruled for a very long time. Uh, you'll see here 74 to 73 all the way to 4 BC. That is um, an extended <laughs> uh, dictatorship, really, uh, because Herod was a terrible ruler. Uh, but when he died in the year 4 uh, BCE, uh, the, his kingdom, Judeo, um, or the Judean province, was divided among his sons. And so Archelaus received the region of Judea, and he ruled for about 10 years there, 4 BC to 6 of the Common Era. Uh, Herod Antipas uh, took the Galilee and Perea, which was up around the, Gal the, the Sea of Galilee, so it's a little bit farther north. Uh, and he was able to have uh, a reign there for a long time. You'll see 4 to 39 of the Common Era. Now, that's, uh, that's a very long time for this time period because it was such in political uh, turmoil. But uh, this is the Herod most, that, that we hear of most in the Gospels. So uh, there are three Herods, Herod the Great, Herod Antipas, and Herod, Herod Agrippa. And you'll see that Agrippa came in after Herod Antipas. So um, there is some confusion in uh, the Gospels in the New Testament about which Herod is which. But uh, there's at least three, and this is, this is how they break down. Uh, Philip, uh, this other son of Herod, took the east of the Jordan, um, which was a small region and uh, wasn't a real successful leader there. Not long after that, and these were all, while Herod was a client king, all these were tetrarchs, and uh, they, they absolutely did whatever Rome told them to do. There was just no, uh, they, they did not exercise independence from Rome. They um, actually got their authority from Rome and ruled from that authority. Herod Agrippa did more so than the others because in 39, he was given control over the whole of Judea again. But you can see that only lasted for about five years. Uh, he was a, a, 
a very good friend of, uh, I think it was Claudius, the emperor Claudius. But when Claudius was deposed as the emperor of Rome, so so was Herod Agrippa. So uh, after the, the when, when Claudius was deposed, uh, there was some uproar in Rome. Uh, and so there was a fight within Rome about who would run the empire. <clears throat> and it's during that time, from 44 to 66, that Rome did away with all these leaders. So they did away with the political structure of Judea that was headquartered in Jerusalem, and they took direct control from 44 to 66 uh, through their governor. So they would, uh, the, the Roman emperor would appoint governors to Judea, and those governors would run, uh, would run the, the country. And so 44 to 66 was a time where Judeans didn't even have their own leaders, which became a major point of conflict. Uh, even while they had their own leaders, Herod and his sons and Herod Agrippa, they were Judeans, but they were certainly did whatever Rome said. But at the end of the day, they were still Judeans who were in charge. And so they, they might have uh, flexed their strength and all their strength came from Rome, but at least they were still Judeans. From 44 to 66, these were Roman, uh, these were Roman leaders who were appointed by the, the Roman government to govern Judea. And this was uh, very contentious. Uh, the Judeans uh, felt uh, that this was not only wrong politically, but this was wrong from a religious standpoint. And it caused a tremendous amount of controversy. So much so that in 66, uh, here, we'll just kind of jump down. Uh, in 66, there was a revolt against Rome, and it created the Jewish-Roman War that lasted for four years. Uh, from 66 to 69, uh, the Roman legions were brought in from Antioch, where the Gospel of Matthew was most likely written. And Vespasian was the general of, that, uh, of the army at the time. And he came down and just destroyed uh, all of Judea. Uh, and during that time, <clears throat> he was called back to Rome, uh, and he became the emperor of Rome, and he left his son Titus in charge to finish the Jewish revolt. So in 70 of the Common Era, Titus and his uh, army, the Roman army, uh, utterly destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple there. Uh, during that uh, the time of the governors, uh, Pontius Pilate from 26 to 36 was an important figure. Uh, Felix from 52 to 60, Festus, these two are important because Paul mentions them. You know what, Paul doesn't, but the Gospel of Luke, uh, the writer of the Gospel of Luke, who also wrote the Acts of the Apostle, mentions both Felix and Festus. Albinus and Florus are, uh, are two other important um, leaders at that time. Uh, it was under Albinus when James, the leader of the Jesus movement in Jerusalem, was killed. Uh, and then Florus was important because he led it up to the, the revolt. He was the governor when that happened. Uh, so that kind of gives you the idea of the Roman context. It was under this kind of political, social, even religious oppression that not only was the Gospel of Matthew written, but uh, the, the whole life and ministry and death of Jesus was under this kind of Roman context too. So um, the Roman context in Palestine was heavy, uh, just like it was all over the Roman world, but uh, it was so um, tumultuous that it, ended, it, it led to a revolt and war that it, that ended with the temple being destroyed in Jerusalem. And it's out of that experience, the Gospel of Matthew is only written about a decade to two decades after this traumatic experience, um, that it was a definitive moment in Judean-ness and Judean movements across the world at that time. Uh, the, the Jesus movement, the movement that later became Christianity, is absolutely influenced by this, this revolt. So not only is uh, Matthew deeply Jewish, uh, and th th it has a deeply Jewish context, it also has a deeply Roman context, and specifically related to how it understands Gentiles.
I mean, when your country is destroyed by another country, how do you relate to those people? And the Gospel of Matthew is trying to negotiate that relationship. How do Judeans who believe in Jesus uh, interact with Gentiles who may also believe in Jesus or who want to believe in Jesus? This is a primary component to the Gospel of Matthew. Here you'll see uh, the Roman province of Judea. Judea makes up this area right here. Uh, Samaria is also in there and Idumea. Uh, but this whole area is the province of, well, this actually this almost all of this here is the province of Judea. And within the province of Judea, you see these little sections uh, divided up. This would have been, Perea would have been the area where Philip, one of the sons of Herod, uh, ruled. This is the Galilee. Uh, this line here goes around to the Decapolis. Uh, these are all major reg uh, regions. Uh, the Syrophoenician woman that's mentioned in Matthew 15, he calls her a Canaanite. This is where she would have been from. There's this, these mentions of Jesus going into the area of Sidon and Tyre throughout the Gospel of Matthew. This is a very Gentile area, Gentile heavy. And just north of here is... Uh, is Antioch of Syria. Uh, Damascus is the capital uh, of, of this part of Syria. Antioch would have been the capital of the other part. So you can see geographically uh, where this was. <clears throat> so let's talk about the provenance of Antioch um, or, or the, the Antioch as the place of uh, origin for the Gospel of Matthew. One reason we believe that that's the case is because of Ignatius. He was a bishop of Antioch um, by the end of the first century into the second century. And he quotes Matthew within a decade of the gospel being written. So if, if Matthew was written in 80 to 90, uh, Ignatius quotes uh, Matthew, uh, small portions of Matthew within 10 years. And here you'll see some of this um, some of his quotes. So this quote right here is from Ephesians 14, 12. This is letters. Uh, Ignatius, the bishop of Antioch, wrote a letter to the city of Ephesus, the, the church there, to the Ephesians, and he quotes Matthew 12, 33. The tree is known by its fruit. Uh, here in his letter to the Smyrnans, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, he quotes Matthew 19, 12. Let him accept it who can. Uh, and then in uh, this letter to Polycarp, he quotes Matthew 10, 16. In all circumstances, be wise as a serpent and perpetually harmless as a dove. Uh, these, are where, these are places where the Bishop of Antioch quotes the Gospel of Matthew. And, and Ignatius is very early. So we think that Ignatius uh, probably knew the writer of the Gospel of Matthew because the time period is so close. The other one is uh, Paul's description of the Antiochian church in Galatians chapter 2, 11 through 14. This is incredibly important because it's, <clears throat> it's in this short letter of Paul where he narrates conflict between him and Peter. Uh, Peter was one of the major leaders of the early Je Jesus movement. Peter was generally in Jerusalem, but apparently uh, Peter had made the journey up to Antioch to see where Paul and Barnabas' ministry uh, really first started and to determine whether they were doing the right thing or not, specifically related to how they were letting Gentiles into the church and whether by doing so they were violating any scriptures. And so Peter comes there, according to Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, uh, Peter seems to be, do, be endorsing Paul's um, ministry until men from James are sent from Jerusalem. And James is the primary leader of the Jesus movement at that time. When these men arrive in Antioch, Peter withdraws fellowship from the Gentiles. In other words, Peter does an about face. Now this is all according to Paul. So uh, Peter, take, Peter says uh, that Paul's doing wrong when the men show up. Paul calls Peter a hypocrite, uh, but the men from James, 
are so influential that Peter remains on their side, and Barnabas, Paul's co-worker, uh, forsakes Paul and follows those guys. And so Paul uh, writes his letter to the Galatians and tell, basically says that Peter and Barnabas and the men from James were all wrong. And specifically, Paul said that Gentiles did not have to be circumcised, nor did they have to follow food laws to be followers of Jesus. Now, this was incredibly contentious because according to the Jewish scriptures, according to the law, that's exactly what Gentiles had to do to become Judeans and believe in the single God of Israel. And so Paul says because of Jesus, they don't have to do that anymore. Uh, and this is not just a big issue for Paul. This is one of the defining arguments of early Christianity. And the Gospel of Matthew is mediating that issue. Uh, so this is one of the another reasons we think that uh, the Gospel of Matthew was written in Antioch. And finally, issues in Matthew relate most to what's happening in Antioch. Um, <coughs> the way Matthew deals with Gentiles in chapter 15 and in chapter 2-1, uh, that indicates that uh, the Gospel of Matthew is in the middle of this argument in Antioch. And the way Matthew understands the law. Uh, the law is not undone by the ministry of Jesus or by belief in Jesus according to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew for Matthew, Jesus doesn't abolish the law. Uh, Jesus doesn't make the law invalid. Jesus actually fulfills the law, which is exactly what chapter 5, 15 through 21 says. So Matthew is mediating this issue uh, related to Gentiles entering into the covenant with the God of Israel uh, in, in what seems to be a pretty conservative way and in a way that puts him at odds with Paul. So that's the context, that's the Roman context, that's the Jewish context, and that's the, and the context within Antioch of Syria that produced the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, now, for the next few minutes, we're going to pay attention to actual passages from the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, and we'll look first at Matthew chapter 1 and 2, these birth narratives. This is a terrible painting. I mean, it's a great painting, but it's a terrible depiction of what's called the, uh, the slaughter of the innocents. Um, let's see here. Herod's plan, uh, Matthew chapter 2, 13 through 28, uh, tells that the Herod, Herod the Great, um, after learning that Jesus was born uh, from the, the Magi from the east, he has this plot to kill all the uh, male children under two in uh, Jerusalem and the surrounding area. And this is a picture of the slaughter of the innocents. You can see the, the, them decapitating the little children. Uh, this is a part of the birth narrative in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, what I want you to do is look at the genealogy of Matthew uh, 1, 1 through 17. Uh, this is where Matthew uh, talks about Jesus' genealogy. And compare that to the genealogy in Luke chapter 3, 23 through 38. Uh, I want you to spend some time after this uh, presentation uh, reading carefully the differences between these genealogies. N the, neither one of these genealogies uh, are in the Gospel of Mark, uh, and it's totally absent in the Gospel of John. So Matthew and Luke uh, are doing very different things with Jesus' genealogy. They go back to different places, and they go in different directions. So uh, read them carefully and, and, and pay close attention to how different they are. Uh, Matthew, right after the genealogy, Matthew narrates the birth of Jesus in chapter 1, 18 through 25. This uh, birth narrative in Matthew is incredibly different than the birth narrative in Luke. Uh, so uh, read Matthew 1, 18 through 25 and Luke 1, 
26 through 38, and then uh, Luke 2, 1 through 7. Uh, and just uh, as you read, I want you to take notes on Matthew, just the series of events uh, that happen, and, and who are the main characters. Uh, so write both the main events and the main characters of Matthew 1, 18 through 25 in one column. And then in the next column, read this passage from Luke and see who's, uh, who are the main characters um, and how the theme is totally different. So uh, you'll see that there's massive difference between Matthew and Luke. This is the difference is here. The fact that they both have a genealogy and they both narrate the birth of Jesus, but they do it in such radical difference. Um, these are two very different birth narratives. This indicates that Matthew and Luke did not know each other, and they didn't have a co Matthew did not have a copy of Luke beside him when he was writing his gospel, and Luke did not have a gospel of Matthew beside him when he was writing his gospel. They wrote their gospels totally independent of each other, and you'll see that where they where they're in these areas where they're totally different. Uh, in Matthew two one through twelve, this is pretty fascinating. Uh, passage because these uh, it narrates the wise men from the east. This section is only in Matthew, along with Herod's plan to kill all the young children. These are only in Matthew. So the wise men from the east that you hear uh, during Christmas time, that is only in the Gospel of Matthew. That is not in any other place in the Bible. They're not in the Gospel of Luke uh, Matt, uh, or Mark or John. So Matthew's narration of the men in the east, the wise men in the east, or the magi from the east, or the kings in the east, they see a star, and they follow that star to Jerusalem. This is only in Matthew. And when they get there, they go to the king of uh, Israel, Herod the Great, and ask where the new king of Israel is, because according to them, the stars say that a new king is born. And this is where Herod... Uh, gets very paranoid, and he tells them, go find a child and then let me know where he is so that I too can worship him. So the, uh, the Magi from the east uh, go around. They find Jesus in Bethlehem. They bring him uh, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Uh, and then an angel uh, warns them in a dream that they should not uh, respond to Herod and uh, let them go. So uh, it's a it's pretty fascinating uh, mater material, but it's only in Matthew. It's not in any of the other Gospels. So uh, after warning uh, the, the Magi, the Magi go east, don't tell Herod. And this is when Herod plots to kill all the young children in Jerusalem because he feels like there's going to be a threat to his throne. Uh, <clears throat> then we get this passage in Matthew uh, immediately following that. It's only in Matthew that um, there's a flight to Egypt. So uh, Mary and Joseph, uh, realizing that their Jesus is under threat, go to um, Egypt and stay there a couple of years. And when they return, they come back to Bethlehem, but still are afraid. And that's when they move to Nazareth. This is a really different version of events than what Luke has. Luke has them in Nazareth. They go to Bethlehem for Jesus to be born because there's a census uh, and there's no mention of Herod the Great. There's no mention of the slaughter of the innocents. Um, they go back to Nazareth and it's not a big deal. Uh, Matthew is a very different story. Uh, the, the flight to Egypt is reminiscent of Moses. Uh, Moses as a child being born in Egypt and coming out of Egypt. This is a motif that follows uh, Jesus throughout the narrative of Matthew. Almost at every turn, Matthew has Jesus as the new uh, Moses or the next Moses or the new lawgiver. Uh, and so this is an incredible motif and a very important motif in Matthew that Jesus goes into Egypt and comes up back out of Egypt. Um, I'll back up here a little bit to the wise men. This uh, section is important for the Gospel of Matthew because these are Gentiles who recognize that uh, something has happened. 
And this is at the very beginning of the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew begins to deal with Gentiles. Uh, Chapter 2, 1 through 12 is, is the first sustained narrative that involves Gentiles. And these Gentiles recognize that Jesus is the new king of Israel. And they come and pay homage to Jesus. Now, this is very important because it, from the very beginning, from the very outset, Matthew says that there are Gentiles who understand who Jesus is, right? So this is actually a, a good story of Gentiles, uh, that, that God speaks to Gentiles. God uh, or angels reveal uh, God to Gentiles, and Gentiles are able to recognize G- who Jesus is. It does not mean that they are exempt from the law, and that's that'll be a constant theme throughout the, the Gospel of Matthew. So, uh, at, in both of these places, I want you to spend uh, a long time reading Matthew and Luke over against each other, and just see how radically different they are from each other. Uh, read the wise men, see how they're portrayed in the narrative uh, as uh, good characters, and Herod is actually the bad character. Herod is uh, a Jew that um, doesn't believe uh, or, or knows that there's a significance about Jesus but tries to destroy it. Uh, this is a big part of the Jewish context in Matthew. Um, and then it's an interesting, you read this passage from Luke just to uh, read it over against uh, this narrative uh, of Jesus' flight into Egypt and back. So that's uh, the birth narrative, Matthew chapter 1 and 2. Let's look now uh, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, which we find in Matthew chapter 3 and 4. Here, this mosaic is from a church in Ravenna, Italy. It's a beautiful church, Um, and this is their uh, uh, baptistry. So uh, off to the side of the church is this uh, place where they baptize, and above the baptismal font is this mosaic of John the Baptist baptizing Jesus. This is the Latin for Jordan. Uh, Here you have the dove descending on Jesus. It's a fascinating mosaic, and I just wanted to share it. Uh, But this is where, chapter 3 is where the Gospel of Matthew begins to use the Gospel of Mark as a source. Uh, And so you'll see um, Matthew 3, 1 through 12, almost mirroring Mark 1, uh, chapter 1, 2 through 8. In uh, the Gospel of John, it's a real interesting. John the Baptist is in all four Gospels. There are very, very few uh, stories in the four Gospels that exist in all four Gospels, and John the Baptist is one of them, so it's worth noting. Uh, but also, uh, the, the John the Baptist story in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is very different than the John the Baptist story in John. So while it's in all four, the, the, the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are very different than the Gospel of John. Uh, so look at Matthew 3, 1 through 12, and how John the Baptist is depicted. Here's where you'll see almost verbatim quotes from the Gospel of Mark. Also look at Luke, chapter 3, 1 through 9. Uh, there in Luke, you'll also see how Luke deals with the material in Mark. Uh, I do want you to spend some time with these biblical texts and and read them over against each other. See how Matthew, very I mean, these are small differences, but watch how Matthew changes the wording of Mark. What, look at how Matthew uses Mark as a source and then expands the story. What does he neglect? What does he add? And then do the same thing with Luke and uh, and see how Luke is using his source. And then you'll be able to see how Luke and Matthew are using Mark differently as they uh, go through this passage. Uh, So there's the John the Baptist story, who John the Baptist is, and what he was preaching in the desert. Uh, And then uh, following that in the Gospel of Matthew, you have Jesus' baptism, when Jesus was baptized himself. (coughs) You'll notice something really strange about John if you want to read John, uh, but pay close attention to how Matthew differs from Mark. Uh, you, you see here, it's just a couple of verses. Uh, they, they don't quote verbatim, but it's very close. So uh, just like you did with John the Baptist, uh, Matthew, you know how Matthew used Mark as a source and Luke used Mark as a source, pay close attention to Jesus' baptism. Um, 
uh, in Mark, uh, you have Jesus, uh, you know, l listen to God's voice. There's a voice from heaven that speaks. Uh, who does that voice from heaven speak to? Does that voice from heaven speak to Jesus, or does that voice from heaven speak to everybody around? Ask that question about Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, as soon as Jesus is baptized, there's a progression. There's a, there's a progression in all these gospels because they're following Mark, of course. Uh, there's an explanation of John the Baptist, Jesus' baptism. And as soon as Jesus is baptized in all Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, as soon as he's baptized, he's taken into the wilderness to be tempted. Uh, again, these are gr this is great material to um, read back and forth. You'll see that Mark only gives very little information about this, um, so only two verses, uh, compared to Matthew's 17 verses and Luke's 13 verses. So watch how Matthew and Luke use the, the Mark story of the temptation of Jesus and expand on it. That, that, these are great areas to really see how Matthew's using Mark and how Luke uses Mark differently than Matthew. Uh, and then right after Jesus' temptation, the overcoming of temptation, uh, you have Jesus calling his first disciples and the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Uh, again, read them over against Mark and Luke, uh, specifically these passages. Uh, it happens really quick in these, uh, in these narratives. Jesus calls the disciples and they follow him, uh, but spend some time looking at the difference between Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, in the calling of the first disciples and ministry. Specifically, the, who are these disciples? Uh, do they call them, does Jesus call them by name? Uh, pay, pay close attention all of that as we uh, as as you spend some time uh, reading through this material this week. Uh, that's our, our whole uh, lecture for the Gospel of Matthew this week. Hopefully, you've understood that Matthew has deep connections uh, in a Jewish context. Matthew is produced from a Jewish context. Uh, it, Matthew's produced out from under a Roman context. Uh, that context particularly happens to be in the city of Antioch in Syria. Um, and then you look at these passages in Matthew 1 through 4, uh, 1 and 2 being the, the genealogy and birth narratives of Jesus. And then you look in chapters 3 and 4 for G, you know, Jesus' baptism and the beginning of his, uh, of his ministry. Uh, pay close attention in your, in your reading of the text uh, and look at how Matthew uses Mark and how different that is from Luke. If you have any questions, uh, simply send me an email and I'll um, respond to you as soon as I can. All the best.